Firstly, and above all else, I need to add a massive disclaimer before hordes of you go to take to the comment section down below without actually watching this entire video. Yes, grenades were used during the 18th century, just not often by, well, actual grenadier units, uh, and generally speaking, that was only during very particular circumstances like sieges and naval boarding actions and things like that. For this video, I want to talk about why grenades were not often, and please note that quality qualifier used in open field combat, and more specifically, why most grenadiers, particularly British grenadiers, of the mid to late 18th century weren't generally carrying the very tools from which they took their name, like they weren't taking them on campaign with them. I want to talk about why that is. I mean, if you saw my previous video, Who Were the British Grenadiers, then you know that they were often treated as a sort of heavy infantry or, or shock troops. They'd be given some of the most difficult and important tasks in the army. And if they're going to be the lads at the front of the charge, well, wouldn't it make sense for them to carry those grenades? I mean, think about it the way that you might use a grenadier unit in a video game. Your troops are already fighting at close range, and you can't seem to outflank the enemy without them countering with their own reserves. It's becoming a real slugfest. You need to find a way to break through the enemy lines. You don't quite have enough artillery to make it happen, and you're not about to make the rookie mistake of charging your cavalry directly into the enemy's front. So what are you supposed to do? Aha, well, you're already so close to the enemy, such close range, and you have your grenadiers. Perfect! As we learned in that previous video, these lads are the best of their regiments. They're courageous and they're strong. You push them through the fire just a little bit closer, and as they're advancing, you can give them supporting fire with the regular infantry units. And then, when they've run forward a good distance, they can hurl overhead those deadly charges, those iron balls which fall like a hail among the enemy ranks and explode with terrifying force. Those they don't kill outright, they'd wound or concuss. And meanwhile, the shock of it all will disrupt the enemy formations, tearing great big holes in their lines, providing an excellent opportunity for a follow-up with the bayonet. And then, all you need to do is roll up the enemy's flanks, and you have won the day. In an era of linear warfare, when men are fighting shoulder to shoulder, and when scattering or disrupting those very tight formations opens them up to things like cavalry charges, bayonet charges, or even just concentrated volley firing, well, it seems like grenades would be among the best weapons at any army's disposal. And yet, this video is all about why that scenario, the one I just described, really wasn't all that common an occurrence. Why is that? Well, before I answer that, just a quick second of your time if I may to shill out my Patreon page. Did you know that for as little as a dollar a month, or even just only, only $10 for an entire year of membership, you can get week early access to all my videos, a full backlog of my live stream VODs, and even stop in for twice a month patron-exclusive live streams where we watch historical films like Zulu, Master and Commander, or Horatio Hornblower? It's pretty good stuff. I mean, look at this stellar review I got on my 100k announcement post. He seems happy enough with the arrangement, and I'm I'm sure you will be as well. Anyways, it's only a dollar a month, and that dollar really does go an incredibly long way towards helping me to, to keep doing what I do. Um, so to those who do support me on the platform, thank you so very much, and to those who will do so because of this incessant little, uh, you know, ramble, well, thank you as well. I've shilled long enough at you, back to the video. Grenades weren't often used in open field combat in the 18th century. Why is that? Well, a lot of it, I think, comes down to just how situational a weapon the grenade really was. Now, keep in mind that the grenade of the 18th century wasn't the smooth pull-pin-and-release-catch weapon of today. Honestly, they looked a lot more like cartoon bombs. Uh, they were usually iron balls, although they could be made of other materials, like uh, tin or ceramic, even glass, actually, uh, that were then filled with gunpowder with a hole drilled into the top, into which would then be placed a fuse. So the first and the biggest problem that anyone hoping to use these weapons would face would be one of range. You see, unlike the bombardiers of the First World War, fighting in those very close-knit, you know, windy, uh, topsy-turvy trenches, soldiers in the 18th century are often fighting in open fields, or at least relatively open areas when compared to later time periods, of course. Uh, soldiers are moving around in these large blocks, in these large formations, again, marching as one, shoulder to shoulder, and the opportunity in the 18th century to do things like uh, go prone or use cover were, were limited. I mean, it happened, but compared to later time periods, you know, things like 
the First World War, when grenades really came back into use, it's, it's a lot more limited when compared to all that. And in the 18th century, if you want to use these heavy iron grenades, well, you have to get close. Very close. Like, I can't imagine a group of grenadiers being able to reliably get more than, say, I don't know, 30 to 50 yards on the things anywhere near consistently. And maybe one or two guys can, but as an entire unit, it's going to be tough to get a lot further than probably around that distance. Uh, but, oh, you may say, come on, Brand, and everyone knows that muskets are insanely inaccurate. The enemy would probably be hard-pressed to hit you at that distance anyways if there's a battle going on, so why does range matter? Well... Muskets are probably far more accurate than you're thinking. Uh, I'll link a fantastic article on it down below if you want to read more, and maybe I'll do a video on something related in future. But suffice to say for now that it's really not terribly unreasonable to start hitting your targets even out to 300 yards, and that's even with military smoothbore muskets. Now, most battles are really going to start in earnest between like one and 200 yards, maybe a little more, um, but by the time you're getting like closer than 100 yards, I like, yikes, you're gonna be able to hit your marks pretty consistently. That is very close range. That's like, you better start, you know, you, you better give off one volley and then charge with the bayonets kind of range because it's very, very close. You can begin these battles out to 200 yards pretty well pretty effectively. And meanwhile, if those grenadiers have to get within that, you know, say 30 to 50 yards to actually throw those grenades, I mean, having to cross a 150, 200 yard distance while you're actively being fired on, that's going to test the nerves of anyone, even of a grenadier, even of an expert soldier, especially if they're facing a well-trained enemy that's really getting those volleys off on you. And consider as well that if a grenadier is close enough to actually see the target they're throwing their grenades at, and, you know, close enough to throw the grenade very well, well, then they themselves are also going to be a pretty clear target. So that accuracy while those men are, you know, standing there throwing their grenades, that's going to be pretty intense, and they're going to be suffering a lot of casualties in that time. But that's not all. I mean, honestly, marching under fire is among probably the least of any prospective bomb thrower's problems. You see, once the grenadiers are in their own range, they couldn't just toss the grenades outright, they have to light them first. So they take out the grenade, then they remove the burning match they'd keep on their person, uh, usually inside something called a match case, which would be kept on a belt near the uh, on the chest. Um, so you, you, you take that out, and, and uh, hopefully that piece of match hasn't been uh, blown out or extinguished by any sort of funny circumstances. I mean, it, it's slow match, and it's protected inside the match case, so that's really not likely, but I mean, you know, there's always going to be these funny little exceptions, and it's not a perfect system to just have a lit match on you during the long course of a battle, and you use that to ignite the fuse on your grenade. Um, hopefully, incidentally, the air isn't as well too humid uh, to prevent the fuse from going up. Uh, hopefully, it's a good quality fuse that does, in fact, go up nice and quickly, uh, doesn't burn too slowly or something like that. And then finally, you're able to actually toss the thing. But what I mean to say here is that even in perfect conditions, the lighting of the grenade is probably going to be a bit of a finicky business. You're not just able to take it out and toss it. There's a whole process involved before you can do that. Uh, and especially, again, when the grenades are under what's probably a near continuous fire from an enemy who is literally within throwing distance of them. They're trying to light these grenades. It, it's difficult to get across. Uh, but even then, if you believe it, even that probably isn't the worst of the Grenadiers' concerns at that point. Even worse, I think, is of course the fact that in order to actually be able to finagle around with the match and the grenade, well, odds are the Grenadiers are going to have to sling their muskets. Now, yes, they could always just drop them on the ground, but that runs a few possible risks, not limited to being forced to abandon the musket if the enemy comes on to you too quickly, and we'll talk about that soon enough, not, not to worry. Um, and as I understand it, because of things like that, most, if, if not all, in fact, of the grenadier drills back in the day did specify that the men are to sling their firelocks, put it over their shoulders before throwing the grenades, going through all that drill. Um, now, slinging arms over the head can already be difficult enough, and I can speak to that from experience. Um, but more importantly, for the entire time that the soldiers have their muskets slung, they're suddenly very exposed. Now, obviously, they can't be firing back at the enemy during that time, and perhaps much more importantly, they don't have their bayonets readily accessible to them. They're on their back, and they're going to have to unsling the musket if they're, they're going to be able to actually use the thing. 
And again, that enemy is within throwing range. That's very close. So if they see the Grenadiers right up on them with their melee weapons effectively out of reach, getting ready to throw those grenades, are the musket men just gonna stand there and take it? I mean, no. If they're well-disciplined soldiers, they'll fire off a volley, which would already further disrupt the already weakened grenadiers, and then they're gonna charge in with their bayonets. Or alternatively, they could have cavalry waiting in reserve just behind them. They can move past the infantry and really cut the grenadiers up. Because again, they're not ready for a melee engagement. Uh, now, yes, uh, presumably the grenadiers could maybe have a system by which like uh, half the men are throwing the grenades and the other half will continue to exchange the fire. But at that point then, they're still going up as a half-strength force, or even less because they're taking fire the entire time, against what is presumably a near full-strength force in both firepower and in melee strength. Only half Half the men are throwing their grenades, only half are able to exchange fire, and only half of them actually have their bayonets at the ready. So if the enemy decides to charge, or just really, you know, keep up the intense fire, either way, it's probably going to be a losing equation. And all of that still is presuming that the grenades behave as they're meant to do and aren't temperamental at all. Let me throw, and no, no pun intended there, let me throw a few more possible scenarios at you. Say the Grenadiers get into range without suffering too many losses, and the enemy decides for whatever reason not to charge them while they're getting ready to throw those grenades. Well, what happens then when inevitably a few of those Grenadiers happen to light their grenades, they're just about to throw them, and then boom, they get shot, they fall down, and drop the grenade among their own ranks. And what if that happens to a few men within the ranks? Say, say only three or four guys along the line happen to get shot at that critical moment, which is, I think, pretty understandable and believable if the enemy fires off a volley in proper time. Yeah, I mean, maybe the Grenadiers are going to take out that enemy unit, or maybe they'll at least disrupt the enemy unit for a little while, they'll weaken them a bit, but they might just blow themselves up in the process, too. I mean, as it is, again, the enemy is firing on them continuously, so they're going to be losing men left, right, and center, and then if grenades start going off in their midst, I mean, it, it's not going to be a good time. The enemy, yes, will have the grenades going off in their face as well, but, you know, it's not much use if you kill the enemy unit and kill all your cells in the process as well. I suppose you could always have these uh, dedicated men in the ranks to keep an eye out for such things as fallen grenades, or even you could train every soldier of the Grenadiers to keep an eye out for exactly that kind of thing. But that sort of situation, especially in the chaos of battle, you can never expect it to be perfect. I mean, uh, by way of a sort of lateral example, NCOs in battalion companies were to explicitly keep an eye on their men during the firings. Uh, they're looking to the soldiers, making sure that they're loading and firing in good timing, and they're doing what they're trained to do. But there are still plenty of examples of men continually loading their muskets in battle without ever actually firing the things, just sort of putting one cartridge after another. These sorts of things are always going to slip through the cracks, not necessarily in very great numbers, but they will, it will happen. And in the end, it only really takes one grenade going up among a line of men who are all also carrying bags full of grenades. Well, you can see how that might be a problem. <laughs> or maybe a different scenario. Uh, what if the Grenadiers are fighting an enemy that's just ever so slightly above them? Well, they throw the grenades, maybe misjudged a little bit, and then they come rolling back down the hill. Oops again, you heard just you just killed your own grenadier unit. Uh, or or say they're even above the enemy. They roll them down the hill. Well, less dangerous for them, but all the same, there's a pretty good chance that the gren the grenades will just roll right past the foe. Uh, really, the most ideal environment to use a grenade in open field combat would be a perfectly flat plane. And unless you're fighting in Iowa, that's hardly a guarantee for these soldiers in European conflicts. Suffice to say at the end of all this that the grenades of the 18th century were finicky weapons, to say the least. They weren't very reliable, they had a limited range, you know, you could only use them as far as you could throw them. And because of that, they opened up their users to a variety of very dangerous circumstances. And all of those battlefield-specific reasons don't even begin to speak to the wider, more logistical and economic concerns. Uh, grenades are, when compared with, say, lead musket balls or iron solid shot like you'd use in a cannon, they're much more difficult to produce. They're also difficult to transport, on campaign and in battle both, because not only are they quite heavy, but, you know, they're also filled with explosives. 
you'll need to make sure that they're all kept in a very particular area in the same way that you need to keep artillery ammunition in a separate, secured location. All these sorts of little things, they add complexity. And complexity is expensive, and the more, of course, levels of complexity, the greater chances that something goes wrong for you. And all of that, ultimately, for a weapon which only has very limited application. So you can use grenades, of course, but you want to make sure that when you are using them, when you are going through the effort of producing them, of, of sending them out, and of, and of keeping them appropriately, you want to make sure that they're, you're doing so in situations where it's actually going to be worth it, where you know the grenades will be useful to you. And now here's where we circle back to our starting point. None of that means that grenades were not used during the 18th century. Uh, grenades were, in fact, quite often used, and they were desired among numerous militaries of the time period. It's just that they weren't used in the same capacity as they were during earlier time periods, uh, which is to say more like 17th century English Civil War, yada yada yada, um, nor were they being used in the way that I think a, a lot of you know people might imagine because of you know how they're portrayed in games like Empire or Napoleon Total War. Uh, this is all to say they're not being used as generally issued weapons regularly being used in open field combat. Though apparently the Russians were actually, like, particularly keen on them, uh, the Russians actually did train their soldiers to use grenades in open combat, which I thought was really interesting. Um, pr probably warrants more looking into for, for a later time. Uh, really, if anything, it just proves that there's always an exception to the rule, and uh, there's no such thing as an absolute in military history. But if we want to speak more broadly, you know, not nation-specific or exact years or anything, but, but broadly across the mid to late 18th century, where grenades are being most often used is in places like sieges, both by attackers and defenders, and perhaps more iconically during naval combat. Now, I think you can sort of see the reasons why that might be. Uh, but I believe that that as well, my dear viewer, will have to be a video subject for another day if the interest is there. Uh, in the meanwhile, though, if you'd like to learn more about any of that, I'll, I'll link another amazing article by Alex Burns of Cabinets Creek down below in the description for you uh, to read on the topic of grenade use during the 18th century, uh, including those really interesting details that I mentioned learning recently about the Russians continued use of them. Uh, really, I, I cannot recommend the blog enough, so please do check it out if you have any level of interest in really 18th century military history in general. Uh, in any case though, thank you all so very much for watching, and as ever most particularly to my ever beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, to whose generosity I very much owe the privilege of continuing with my work. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.